this morning we're looking at uh, John chapter 16 and just at a couple of verses and really just a couple of ideas in those verses. But I'd like to read the broader context, so uh, let me begin in verse 19 of John 16 through verse 24, and we're looking at verses 23 and 24. Now, this is the upper room discourse. As you know, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his crucifixion and that they wouldn't fall away, that he would, um, they'd be able to stand strong. And, and we see in this context him comforting them, but also giving them a promise that apparently they haven't used up to this point. And it's one that from this point forward is something that everyone who loves and trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ can make use of. And that is asking the Father for whatever we want in the name of Jesus and knowing that we will receive those things. So, verse 19, Jesus knew that they wished to question him. And he said to them, um, and again, when he said, I should have backed up maybe a little bit further, uh, yet a little while you won't see me, but then in a little while you'll see me again. So Jesus knew they wished to question him and he said to them, are you deliberating together about this that I said? A little while you will not see me, and again a little while, uh, and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. In that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be made full. Well, may the Lord bless his, his word to our understanding now. Well, as I've already said in our passage, Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples, preparing them for his departure. In a little while, they would no longer see him. He would be arrested, as we know. He'd be condemned and crucified. Uh, their hearts would be crushed. They would be grieved. The Lord that they loved so much would be dead. But as a woman in labor forgets her pain for joy that a woman has, excuse me, that a child has been born, so they would forget their grief when they see Jesus again. Jesus would be raised from the dead. Now, this is something we're going to, of course, be looking at more closely, Lord willing, next Lord's Day morning. But Jesus says at that time, all their questions would be answered about his going away, about they're seeing him again and their grief turning to joy. But before he goes to the cross, he wants again to comfort them. He wants to strengthen them. And he comforts them by giving them a promise that now that his work was just about complete and now that they would be left uh, very shortly to, to carry on uh, the work that... Uh, well, that, that has to be carried on. Jesus really, remember, just evangelized Palestine, but there was quite a bit of the world yet to be evangelized, and they were going to need help. Jesus is showing them how to get that help. They could ask the Father for anything in his name, and he would give it to them. Now, this is the promise we want to focus on this morning. Remember, last week we noticed that Jesus, as our mediator, as our king, is the one who is in absolute and sovereign control of the world. He is said by the author to the Hebrews to uphold all things by the word of his power, by which the author to the Hebrews means that Jesus is the one who keeps everything in being. He upholds everything in existence. We don't have independent existence. We don't, we're, you know, we don't exist in and of ourselves. We are dependent upon God. Well, we're dependent on Christ. He's the one that upholds us. And he is the one who moves everything along according to God's plan. Now, that because he is in control of all things, the fact that he is, he can make everything, as we saw last week, conspire together 
for our good. We know that not everything he allows in our lives uh, that we've been looking at really in the evening, how the Lord uses evil for good purposes, not everything he allows is good, but he works it for our good. And because he does, not only will we ultimately arrive in heaven, but he will make sure that everything that he brings along the way, he, he will use to prepare us for that glorious place. He's going to work it together for good, for our good. And, and our good ultimately meaning that uh, we'll become more like Christ and better equipped to serve him in his kingdom and more fit for heaven. Now, this morning, I want us to consider his promise, a promise that, um, you know, another promise, I should say, besides the one we just looked at, that he's going to work all things together for our good, a promise that is meant also to give us joy in this world. And that is the promise of answered prayer. And let me just say that you know, we're looking at this in the context of a series of why should we love the Lord? Well, here's another reason. Because he has given to us a way to get everything that we need in order to uh, exist, in order to live, in order to serve him. Now, what I'd like us to do, first of all, is remember what prayer is. And, and that's what we've been looking at in that series by R.C. Sproul. Now, Sproul has reminded us in that series that uh, prayer is not simply asking for things. You know, we might get that impression from what we just read here. But we know that the book of Psalms and all the examples we have in Scripture, the examples we have of our Lord Jesus um, himself, we know there are many other elements, there are many other parts. And R.C. gave us that very helpful acronym, ACTS, right? to help us remember what those elements are. And they are the elements we are to be using when we spend time with the Lord in prayer, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And let me just note, as we think about these for a moment, that perhaps the most important one, and the one that R.C. said, that if we engage in, if we spend some time doing this each time we pray, we may find that very shortly, most of our prayer is gonna be taken up in this one element, and that is adoration. Rather than just, you know, asking the Lord for things, spending time admiring Him, you know, thinking about what He's like and, and worshiping Him, adoring Him for who He is and for what He's, he's done. Um, as a matter of fact, that's a good way to start any petition. You know, think about that attribute of God that directly relates to that petition that you're going to lift up and extol Him, honor Him, worship Him for that particular attribute. Confession, of course, uh, R.C. made a, uh, the distinction between confessing our sins because we're afraid God's going to drop the hammer on us, which is the wrong motivation, but rather confessing our sins as being grieved that we've actually offended God. We're sorry. We love Him, and we know that what we've done is not pleasing to Him. So we admit that, and we also admit, as he said, something we don't like to admit, that the sins we've committed against God actually do deserve damnation. We don't have a leg to stand on apart from His mercy and grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we confess that to the Lord, that He is just, He would be just in punishing us, but then thanking Him for His mercy and His grace. But of course, as a part of this confession, we also need to be willing to turn away from those sins and begin doing the right thing. It's one thing to confess it, but it's another thing to want to actually put that sin to death. And the only way we do it is by God's grace, again, not only turning away from the wicked thing, that the evil thing, sinful thing, but turning to its righteous counterpart. There is a righteous counterpart to virtually every sin and begin doing that, going the right direction and moving that way away from the wrong direction we have been going. Thanksgiving is also to be included in our prayers. You remember the sin of ingratitude is something that God finds particularly evil. We need to make sure we thank the Lord for every answered prayer, for every grace, for every mercy that He shows to us, uh, for not giving us what we deserve and for all the good that he has given us instead. You know, forget none of his benefits, the psalmist writes. And of course, we know what supplication is. Asking for the things that we desire from him. 
Now, not surprisingly, all of these elements that are included in prayer are also included in worship, which is one of the reasons, again, why the Lord wants us to gather together to worship Him. We know that the Lord calls us to worship Him from His Word, and, he, and we respond to that by adoring Him, by worshiping Him, by thanking Him. That's what we've been doing through these psalms of praise and thanksgiving. And let me just note here, sometimes, and particularly, this may happen when we sing hymns. You know, sometimes we don't find the tunes protect, particularly stirring, uh, and we may feel like it's a little bit quenching. But what we really need to do is think about the words that we're singing and offer them to the Lord because we're not going to find any better words than those penned many years ago by these great heroes of the faith that the Lord has gifted His church. Uh, as a matter of fact, I mentioned that uh, because of that treasure that's back there, we have um, uh, more you know, contemporary worship leaders taking those older hymns and putting them to a more modern chord progression to make them perhaps a little bit, you know, nicer sounding. Uh, so we can combine maybe better music. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it isn't. Uh, but we can combine those things together again to worship the Lord. And why do we sing? Well, as Jonathan Edwards would say, because singing stirs our affections. It strengthens our affections for the Lord so that we might again adore Him with a greater zeal well, of course, the Lord also calls us to repentance. That's why we read portions of the law of God. And we respond by confessing our sins and turning from our sins and determining not to do them again. Uh, in our worship, we supplicate the Lord. We ask Him for His blessings. And we know the Lord hears us and answers us in His timing. Again, as we're going to see if we pray according as He calls us to. The Lord declares His gospel to us. We've already talked about it. Jesus bore our sins. Jesus died. He rose again from the dead. Jesus lived a perfect life. And by trusting in Him alone, we, we get all the benefits of what He's done. But He declares His gospel to us week by week so that we might respond in faith and obedience and thanksgiving. And He also shows us how we are to live on the basis of what He has done so that we can respond to His grace in the way we should. We need to remember that every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper that God is declaring to us again the gospel that He has given to us in the Bible in word, here in symbol, so that we can again be confirmed in His love and that we may res respond with thanksgiving and that we may, as we know from the warning that is attached to this, purpose to live a life for His glory and then the Lord dismisses us with His blessing to give us again His grace to empower us to live as we have again committed ourselves that we are going to live for His glory. That's one of the reasons, one, one of the reasons that um, having the Lord's Supper is very helpful for us if we have it on a weekly basis. And that's because it seems to be the only the only um, element of worship, the only what we call the means of grace that God has given us that has a warning attached to it. We need to make sure we deal with our sins and we renew our covenant with Him before we come to the table. And if we do that every week, it, it helps us remember what we're all about as Christians. You know, we're not here to live for ourselves. We're here to live for the Lord's glory. Well, I've already told you that Jesus also teaches us how to order these elements in the Lord's Prayer and what the burden of our prayer should be, that the Lord wants us to begin with adoration. And actually, the acronym ACTS, it, it works, right? Because the A stands for adoration. When we say, our Father who is in heaven, the Lord wants us to remember His grace of adoption towards us through the Lord Jesus Christ and to love Him more for that adoption and the privileges that this gives us, that we may come to Him. That's... Again, something to stir us up to adoration, to thank Him for this. When we pray, hallowed is your name, we're praying that we and everyone else in the world would adore Him, okay? would honor Him as God, as He should be honored. Uh, you know, when we, when we pray, hallowed be your name, we're not only praying that His name would be reverenced, but let's not forget whose name it is. 
That name refers to him. So we're not just praying that his name would be honored. We're praying that he would be honored. And that, of course, is tied to adoration. And then it's interesting. Before we come to confession, Jesus tells us, begin with supplication. First, your kingdom come. And that's a prayer that God's kingdom would grow and would fill the earth. By the way, that's, that's one of the things we can pray and know that God will hear because that is what He has told us He intends to do. That's what He's told us we should pray for. And, and we know from, again, prophecy that one day his, his kingdom will fill the entire earth, so we can pray for that, and that should be the burden of our prayers. Pray for this first, that it would advance. Second, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's not a prayer that God's plan would be carried out, though that is a part of it. But this is a prayer that his law would be obeyed. You know, in the same way that the angels and, and the spirits of righteous men and women made perfect in heaven obey him, which is perfectly. We're praying that as the kingdom expands, that more and more people would begin to obey him. And we know ultimately what that means is that they would love God and honor him as God, as in that first petition. And it would mean that everyone would love their neighbor as they love themselves. That, that's, that's a good thing. You know, that's, that's what the kingdom of heaven is all about. Uh, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. But it's a kingdom of love. It's a kingdom of loving each other in the way we're supposed to. So we should pray for that. Then thirdly, give us this day our daily bread that he would then give us the things we need for each day. The food we need, the covering we need, the health and the strength, and let's not forget His Spirit, that He would give us the things we need so that we might live for His glory. And then we get to confession. Forgive us our debts, that the Lord would pardon our sins. And then that very interesting modifier, in the same way that we forgive others. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. You know, R.C. Sproul in that series is going to talk about what that means. Uh, what he says is this, if, if somebody offends you and they come to you and they ask for your forgiveness, you need to forgive them. Don't have a hard heart. Don't be ungracious. Don't be unmerciful. Forgive them. And if they don't come to you and ask for forgiveness, you need to have the desire that they would come to you and ask for forgiveness. Don't you become bitter against them and hate them, but be merciful towards them, even as our Lord showed mercy towards those who hated Him. Well, and then there are supplications attached to this confession. Do not lead us into temptation. And that is that God would not bring us into trial. He would not bring us into testing. But that He would deliver us from the evil one. That He would give us grace not to fall into the devil's snares, his temptations, or that we might escape if we already have. And then we are to end with more adoration. Again, looking to the Lord and realizing that he alone uh, is really the reason why he should answer any of these prayers because this is his kingdom that we're praying for. Okay? The glory that we're asking from the extension of the kingdom and everything he does, it belongs to him. And again, the power, he alone has the power to do anything about these things, to bring them about. So this is how we are to order our prayers. This is the burden of our prayers. We need to remember as well that prayer is not simply going through a list of things. You know, I've checked off this list. I've followed this pattern. I've done everything the Lord calls me to do. But prayer is spending time with God in communion through the Lord Jesus Christ, worshiping Him, adoring Him, confessing, again, our sins, lifting up our desires that He would be glorified. It, it's communion with Him. You know, and you know what the thing is interesting that we often forget is that it's not one way, is it? It's not one way communication. God actually speaks to us as we pray. And we need to listen for his voice. Now, how is he going to speak to us? Well, not audibly. And he's not going to tell us things outside of the word. But I believe what he's going to do is bring to our 
minds passages. Have you ever asked the Lord a question in prayer? Lord, I don't understand this. Give me wisdom. And then he brings to mind a passage of Scripture. It's like, that's the answer. Or if you have the Bible open in front of you, and you're, you're praying and you're asking God for wisdom and the Lord speaks to you through His Word. It is a two-way communication. We can have that with God, the God of the universe. I, th I think sometimes we take that for granted. But the God who created all things, who is infinitely holy, that we would have no right to come to at all, has invited us to come as His children and spend time with Him. And that's something we can do. And something we ought to do and count a tremendous privilege and, and love Him for it. You know, again, the fact that we can approach Him at all is infinite grace and mercy, but that we can approach Him as His children. Knowing He will receive us is a privilege He has given to us through Christ, our mediator, and we should love Him for this. But let's look at the things Jesus tells us in our passage quickly. He tells us, first of all, that when it comes to our supplications, which are our petitions, our requests, he says, you can ask the Father for whatever you want, but let's not forget that there are certain boundaries that are, are given in other parts of Scripture. Um, I come from a health and wealth background. Okay? It was my background from ages 12 to 17. And I know what they do with passages like this. Okay? They love passages like this. They, they love to say that, that this passage tells us God will give us whatever we desire, whatever your heart desires. He'll heal all your sicknesses. He'll give you as much money as you could possibly want. He'll give you that nice house. He'll give you that fast car. He will give you whatever, okay? As long as, it's not overtly sinful, but they don't realize that everything that I've just mentioned, <laughs> if you is not what God wants you to have, right, uh, necessarily, okay? But they say, all you need is faith, and if you have enough faith, you can claim it, God will give it to you. And I just want to tell you, that is not true. That's not what Jesus is saying. This kind of thinking, I, I, I was in a group of people that thought this way, and, and even though at the time I really didn't know what was going on, I can reflect back and I can think about it now. All that thinking does is feed the flesh, it does not promote godliness. It just makes us lust and covet because our minds turn to the things of the world and we want the things of the world. We think God's going to give it to us, but He isn't. Do you know what it is that actually makes us more like God, makes us more like Jesus? It's the very thing that Paul discovered that actually works. It's suffering. <laughs> it's not self-indulgence, okay? That's why Paul prayed that he might know the fellowship of Christ's suffering. Now, he wanted to know Christ's power as well, but that power comes through suffering, experiencing the sufferings that Christ experienced. Why do you think Paul was so abused? Well, it, it was part of God's plan to make him more like Christ. It was part of God's plan to advance the kingdom. It's... it's you know, when, when the Lord shows His power to you and makes you a powerful witness, it draws the hatred of the world and you suffer for it. But all these things make us like Him. Now, James tells us quite plainly that if we ask for anything purely to satisfy our lusts, that God will not give it to us. James 4, verse 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. And you know what? The interesting thing is that, that my mother who was taking me to that church and myself, we were praying for certain things that God never gave us. And the reason was right here. And if that pastor had understood that and if he you know, had, had uh, taken that on board, maybe he would have done less damage to the people who were listening to him. God is not going to give us anything that he knows ultimately will harm us. God does not want to feed our lusts. He wants to help us put them to death. So the question is, what may we ask him for knowing that he will answer? Well, John tells us in our meditation, this is the confidence we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, 
we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. Now, this means two things. First, we may ask for the things that we know are his will, okay? His revealed will. And that's, you know, there, there's two components to that, okay? First, we can ask for what he's promised, okay? If God makes a promise to us, we can ask, and we can know that he'll hear us and give us those things. You know, we looked in the book of James in the first chapter where he writes this, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If he makes a promise, you can pray for that. We can ask for the things that we've already seen in the Lord's Prayer. Jesus says, I want you to pray for these things. Well, why? Is because that those are the things that he's going to answer, right? Uh, whether we pray that his name be honored, his kingdom be advanced, that people obey his will, that he would give us our daily necessities that we need to serve him and forgive us of our sins, we can ask for those things, he will give them to us. And let's not forget, um, he will also answer this prayer that we can ask for the help of his Holy Spirit. Let's not forget that. That's the most important thing we can ask for. Jesus said in Luke 11, verse 13, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Uh, by the way, the Holy Spirit and his presence is very key to the answer to the question, what is evil, where did it come from? And that's what we're going to plumb a little bit more this evening. But let me just say this, the more you have of the Spirit of God, the more you are filled with his presence, the more you are under, as it were, his control, his gracious, you know, that gracious influence to, um, producing what Edwards would call religious affections, which is a genuine love for God and for holiness, the more you are going to be like Jesus and the less you're going to be like the devil who has nothing of the Holy Spirit. This should be our main request, our main supplication every single day. When the Spirit, remember when the disciples had been threatened by the, the leaders of Israel and they came back to their, their fellows and they, you know, they knew they still needed to do what Jesus called them to do. They needed courage. And so they prayed for boldness and the Lord answered with a fresh infusion of the Holy Spirit. The place where they were gathered was shaken together and they began to speak the Word of God with boldness. By the way, the second part of what God's revealed will is, is really mentioned here as well. And that is, his revealed will is that the kingdom of heaven fill the earth. And that's why Jesus tells us to pray for those things, right? So basically it's this, if the kingdom of heaven and its advancement and God's glory in advancing the kingdom is first in our hearts, if that's our main goal in life, Jesus is telling us, we can ask for the things that need to take place for that to happen and the things that we need in order to bring that about. And by the way, that, that encompasses everything we need, you know, everything you would hope for as a Christian, everything you would desire, the, the strength you need, the ability you need, the power you need, the courage you need, the provision you need, everything is tied up in that. If the kingdom is first in your hearts, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, all these things will be given to you in, in his time, according to his will. Remembering there are other things that come into that as well, especially when it comes to health, right? The Lord has a purpose for bringing that problem with our health or that... Um, well, relational difficulties we may be going through, but he's got to accomplish those purposes first before he removes them, and we need to bear that in mind as well. But that is, first of all, asking for things according to his revealed will, but let's not forget there is also his secret will. Those things that he has not yet revealed, and for, let me give you a few examples. We don't know whom the Lord has chosen, right? We don't know when we first start off in life what the Lord perhaps has called us to do. What is the vocation? I think for all of us here, maybe we already know what that is, but for some of us, we may not. Um, it appears, and this, this may seem strange, but it appears as though Jesus may not have been certain whether there may have been another way 
to accomplish his Father's will than by going to the cross. If you're willing, let this cup pass. If there's another way, you know, uh, spare me this mercy, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Now, when we're praying for somebody's salvation, when we're praying for things that, that are part of God's plan that hasn't yet been revealed, um, we do need to pray like Jesus did. If you're willing, please do this. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, if you're willing, save our children. Lord, if you're willing, grant me this particular position, uh, this employment, or let me go to this college, or show me if this is the one that you were giving to me as a spouse. Is this the right direction for me to go? You know, if we're, if we're asking according to his will, according to his plan, in that sense, God will answer that request. Thirdly, we need to ask in the name of Jesus. Okay, and these last two points are very brief. Verse 23, truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. What does that mean? Well, Jesus, as our mediator, has provided this open door for us to the throne of grace through his perfect life and through his atoning death. We do not deserve for the Father to allow us to enter into his presence and to ask him for anything in and of ourselves. Okay, we can't come in our own name. But Jesus does deserve that, and he authorizes us to use his name. It's like Jesus is handing us his gold credit card, and he's saying, ask, you know, use it for whatever you want, just make sure it's for the kingdom. Okay? Uh, but we can ask for whatever we want to promote his cause in this world, and he will give it to us because Jesus deserves it. So we may not only come, but we can know that we will be received as Jesus himself. And then finally, let's not miss this point. Jesus gave his disciples and he gave us this promise so that we might experience his joy. Verse 24, until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. Now again, how do we understand this? I'm sick, God delivers me, makes me joyful. Is that what Jesus means? Well, it could be a part of it. Could it mean I, I, I have, I'm sort of middle class and I pray for wealth and God gives me that wealth and now I'm overjoyed that I've got all this money? No, that's not what he's talking about. But what he's talking about is, again, remember the burden of, of the prayer that he wants us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, that God's kingdom advance. And think about this, that Jesus' greatest pleasure, the thing that brought him the greatest joy, the thing that he rejoiced in, was serving his Father on earth and accomplishing his will. Remember, that's what he told his disciples when they came to him with food outside of the city of Samaria and so forth. He says that, I have food to eat that you don't know anything about. And my food is to do my Father's will and to accomplish His purpose, okay? And that's what satisfied Him. That's what gave Him joy and pleasure. Now, what Jesus is saying here is this, that He has promised to give us what we need so that we might also serve the Father advancing His kingdom so that we might also experience His joy. That is, the joy that Jesus experienced. And let me just tell you that there is nothing more satisfying than knowing that you've been able to do something for the Father's glory, to know that you have honored Him, to know that you're doing what, you, what He's called you to do, that you are in His will, you are serving Him. That is more satisfying than anything else you can imagine. Anything that the world has to offer, you know, people are going to sporting events, they're going to concerts, they're going to various things to get this adrenaline rush. And there is, I suppose, a certain sense in which those things are pleasurable, but for the Christian, there is nothing as pleasurable as serving the Lord and knowing that He is using you for His glory. And that's what Jesus wants us to experience, which is why He gives us this right to pray and ask for the ability to be able to do that. 
So in conclusion, let me just say this. We should love God. Not only because He has promised to grant us these requests, everything we need to live and to be equipped to do His work, but also because in granting us these things, He gives us the opportunity, the privilege of experiencing the same joy that Jesus experienced in His service to His Father. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and uh, let's ask the Lord to help us to understand this and to apply this and to be able to experience this joy that he's referring to here, that we might love him even more. And let's all so particularly prepare to renew our commitment to him as we come to the table, remembering what Jesus, his greatest joy was, you know, for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame. He went through the suffering that he might experience the joy that would be his, that exaltation and the people he would receive. Well, the Lord says that there is also uh, reward and joy and rejoicing for us on the other side of all the suffering we have to go through. This is just the means to be able to go through that suffering and to rejoice while we're doing it. But let's remember that as we prepare to come to the table.